Rose here. Thanks for clicking on this video. Please make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons because it really helps this video go out to a wider audience. Recently, during a July 2023 midweek meeting, the Watch Our Bible and Track Society had a part on defending and legally establishing the good news. During that part, they played the video tour of the legal department at World Headquarters. In the video regarding the Watch Our Bible and Track Society's legal department, all witnesses were told, you can stay informed of legal developments by means of reports provided by the faithful and discreet slave. Here, you can let me just play the first part of it, because I have some things to say about that. Stephen Lett explained in this video that the legal department was created at World Headquarters in 1936, and that today the World Headquarters legal department organizes the defense of kingdom interests worldwide. Now, at one time, that may have been true, but is it today? Let's compare with the organization's lawyer, because that's all they had at one time. One lawyer, not an entire department. Let's go over some of the cases that were being tried in the past and compare them to what the Watchtower's legal department is being used for today. In the United States, Numerous cases involving Jehovah's Witnesses have actually gone all the way to the Supreme Court regarding freedom of religion and speech that has benefited other religions. The first that I could find was in 1938. The case started in Griffin, Georgia. Alma Lovell, one of Jehovah's Witnesses, was arrested for violating the city ordinance of selling a pamphlet in a magazine in violation of the city's ordinance prohibiting the distribution of any kinds of literature without the prior permission of the city manager. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society's leading counsel at that time, Olin R. Moyle, argued that this was religious material and violated the First Amendment of free speech so was therefore unconstitutional all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled it was not constitutional for a city to require such sanctions. In all, Jehovah's Witnesses brought 23 separate First Amendment actions before the United States Supreme Court between 1938 and 1946. These cases are now landmark decisions regarding the First Amendment for all religions and their right to freedom of speech. Since 1946, there have been multiple other similar cases brought before the courts and won by Jehovah's Witnesses, the most recent being in 2002 in Stratton, Ohio. In the video regarding the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society's legal department, it stated that the legal department was set up in defending and legally establishing the good news worldwide. Witnesses were told that it was important to stay informed of legal developments by means of reports on JW.org. But does the Watchtower organization actually show all of the cases they are defending right now? Is that what the legal department really is defending today? To quote the Watchtower organization, the answer is a resounding no. Why do I say that? Because right now, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is tied up in the court systems worldwide defending their policy on child sexual abuse happening within the organization. But you're never going to see any of those cases on their website. As you See here, in the October 1st, 2012 letter to all bodies of elders, on page 3, paragraph 11, Jehovah's Witnesses require the testimony of two material witnesses to establish a perpetrator's serious sin in the absence of a confession by the perpetrator. The scripture they use to back this policy is Deuteronomy 19.15, where it says, no single witness may convict another for any error or any sin that he may commit. On the testimony of two witnesses or on the testimony of three witnesses, the matter should be established. 
In other words, you can have a victim come forward, but if there's not another witness to the child sexual abuse, the sin, as the organization calls child sexual abuse, can't be corroborated. In other words, one or two people have to watch and be a witness when a child is sexually assaulted. The Watchtower organization considers this policy to be a protection against malicious accusations of child sexual assault. Now, I find that to be a joke in itself. Who's going to molest a child in front of someone else in order for them to corroborate the victim's story? Once again, the organization uses a cherry-pick scripture to back their child sexual abuse policy. The scripture that really applies regarding child sexual abuse would be Deuteronomy 22, verses 25 through 27. Here it states that if a man rapes a girl in the field, the case is the same as when a man attacks his fellow man and murders him, because the girl screamed, but there was no one to rescue her. No one heard her screams. Now, that scripture completely goes against the organization's two-witness policy regarding child sexual abuse. The girl does not need a second witness to corroborate her rape. As you see here in a letter to all bodies of elders dated November 6, 2014, on page 2, under confidentiality, it says if an elder were to breach confidentiality, he could subject himself and the organization to civil liability. In addition, an elder's breach of confidentiality could result in a legal waiver of the minister-communicant privilege or the lawyer-client privilege. The minister-communicant privilege generally prevents an elder under specific circumstances from having to disclose confidential communications between the elder and a member of the congregation. And the lawyer-client privilege generally protects an elder from having to disclose confidential communications between elders and his lawyers, including the organization's legal department. On page 3, paragraph 12, under Orders for Disclosure, if an elder receives a summons or if they hear that one may be issued, seeking oral or written information from someone concerning congregation matters, what are they supposed to do? Call the legal department immediately. The elders are told to never turn over records, notes, or other documents, or reveal any confidential matter sought by summons, citation, or diligence without doing what? They have to first receive legal direction from the legal department at the Watchtower headquarters. Again, elders are told documents and records in congregation files may be protected from disclosure based on qualified privilege, specific legislation, or the lawyer-client privilege. Elders are told that if someone threatens to get a summons or discovery notice for congregation-related records or testimony regarding child sexual abuse, they are to call the legal department immediately. Now, the reason for that is the legal department can then assess whether the state requires reporting or not. It has nothing to do with whether the perpetrator is guilty or not. It's about protecting the organization, not the victim. The organization's lawyers have tried to use all kinds of loopholes in the courts regarding their stance against a man or woman who commit child sexual abuse. They have claimed clergy penitent privilege or priest penitent privilege. You know, when a priest can't disclose any communications between a member of the church and a priest or clergy in a confession. But since when are elders considered priests 
or clergy. When his going to the elders been like the Catholics' practice of weekly confessions. In fact, elders have recently found themselves in court and charged for not reporting child sexual abuse cases that they were aware of. Why? Because they listened and obeyed to what they were told by the organization. Why are elders even involved when it comes to child sexual abuse of any kind? Why wouldn't parents go directly to the police? Why would child sexual abuse be a congregation matter and not a legal matter for the police to investigate? Because that's what police do. They investigate whether something is true or false. What about the organization itself? There are ongoing settlements of cases by the Watchtower organization defending their protection of the perpetrator, not their help for the victims. Most of these are settled out of court with gag clauses, which restricts information or comment from being made public. They're trying to hide these cases. The cases worldwide regarding child sexual abuse within the organization are ongoing and numerous. The more cases that become public, the more victims are starting to speak out about what the organization put them through. Look what's happening in Pennsylvania right now. Five Jehovah's Witnesses are being charged with sexual assault and child exploitation. It's really a simple Google search. Once you bring it up, you can really go down a dark rabbit hole of past and present ongoing child sexual abuse cases that are being brought before the judicial systems around the world. The millions and millions of dollars that are being paid out in settlements. Recently, Hawaii ordered $40 million to a child sexual abuse victim against the organization. But child sexual abuse isn't the only thing the Watchtower organization's lawyers argue in court. The organization's lawyers have also defended their disfellowshipping policy. Here is one of the organization's lawyers defending the disfellowship arrangement in court. Notice what he has to say. Well, the elders came to the decision that Mr. was not sufficiently repentant for his disgraceful conduct, and the congregation elders took the decision to disfellowship him. That word is used by Jehovah's Witnesses. They, Jehovah's Witnesses don't use the word shun or shunning. They refer to it as disfellowship, disfellowshipping, disfellowshipped, because that really gives the, the, the sense of what's taking place within this particular religious community. Disfellowship literally means no further spiritual fellowship with the, with the individual. And as I point out, sorry, Chief Justice. But is that really the stance of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society? No. The organization tells all witnesses that they are showing loyalty to Jehovah and love for the disfellowshipped one by completely shunning them. As seen here in the December 2020 Life and Ministry Workbook. Norway has recently taken away the Watchtower organization's religious funding and status as a religion. The organization's lawyers tried to fight for their right to disfellowship. In other words, shun individuals. Anthony Morris, the once governing body member who is no longer one, gave a talk regarding this and how the organization will never stop their so-called Bible-based practice. The authorities in Norway have threatened to remove our legal registration because of our scriptural beliefs and practices regarding disfellowshipping. In the future, 
Various governments will challenge our freedom of worship. They may pressure us to change our scriptural beliefs, but we're certainly not going to do that. Which is anything but biblical, as I showed in my video regarding the history of disfellowshipping in the organization. I'll link that in the description for you. But like I said, you're never going to see any of these court cases on their website, will you? The Watchtower organization is really good at hiding their corruption from all witnesses. They've been doing this since Charles Russell, the founder of the organization, was found guilty trying to cheat people with his miracle wheat or his cancer cure and his ugly divorce. In the video regarding the legal department I brought out earlier in this video, witnesses are told the World Headquarters Legal Department organizes the defense of kingdom interests worldwide. Really? Is defending their policy on child sexual abuse in kingdom interests? Mostly, what you're going to see under news on JW.org are articles about those who are being persecuted because of their fellowship and preaching work. But I have a question about that. During the COVID pandemic, the door-to-door -door preaching work came to a complete halt because the United States government said you can go door-to-door -door or meet in person. The organization listened to that order and completely halted door-to-door -door service and in-person meetings worldwide. So why does the organization make Jehovah's Witnesses go against government orders when it comes to meetings and preaching today? Why can't witnesses in countries where they are banned from going door-to-door -door and meeting publicly do what the organization had all witnesses around the world do during the pandemic when the United States government put a stop to in-person meetings and public preaching. They had them do it from the privacy of their own homes. I guess if the organization did that, they wouldn't have anything to put up under news on JW.org. They really have this need to show Jehovah's Witnesses that they are being persecuted. If you are presently an active Jehovah's Witness, you may think I'm finding fault with the organization without proper cause. You may not have been aware of the multitude of child sexual abuse cases, but the facts are easily available. There's also many videos with the Watchtower lawyers lying about the policies of the governing body insist all those in the Watchtower organization follow and obey. So when you think about what I've said in this video, what do you now believe is the focus of the Watchtower legal department? Do you agree that hiding decades of child abuse behind a twisted interpretation of one scripture regarding the two witness rule would be something that God would approve of as his channel here on earth, especially when you find out about all of the victims and or parents who have been disfellowshipped because they reported the sexual abuse to worldly authorities. Will you try to unsee the evidence? Again, these are facts that are easily proven. There are countless videos of Watchtower lawyers lying in court about disfellowshipping, countless cases of child sexual abuse where the victims were instructed to not go to the authorities and where the perpetrator was never brought to justice, it was brought to light in Australia alone at the Australian Royal Commission. During this trial, Watchtower records showed 1,006 documented perpetrators that were never reported to the police. Like I asked earlier, 
is fighting cases of hiding and not reporting child sexual abuse within the organization worldwide or defending their shunning practice of disfellowshipping in court. Part of that kingdom interest, as was stated in the video on the legal department put out by the Watchtower organization, are the organization's claims of fighting for kingdom interests. The main thing Watchtower lawyers are busy fighting for right now. Or is that just propaganda put out by the Watchtower organization to hide what the legal department at the Watchtower headquarters are really busy with worldwide? The majority of the legal department's time is spent either defending their disfellowshipping policy, which they lie about in court, and defending their child sexual abuse policy. In reality, why does the Watchtower organization have such a large legal department? I look forward to your comments and thoughts. Well, hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, please make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons to help this video go out to more people. And as always, please take care and thanks for watching.